Uh, hi, I'm Arthur, and this is part 9 in a 20-part series of videos I'm doing covering a more in-depth look at the Primarchs in order of their legions. Do you need to have seen the other parts to understand this one? No, but it would make me happy. Ferris Manus is one of the reasons why I started doing this series. I wasn't going to cover all the Primarchs initially, but a really good friend of mine and fellow content creator, the gaming storyteller, which you should subscribe to, by the way, he's been one of the biggest supports for this channel behind the scenes that anybody could ask for. I can't even convey how much he's actually helped me run this channel just through tips and tricks alone. He's a great guy. But I, I told him I was in a bit of a rut one day and that I needed more ideas to kind of create content, and I mentioned that I had a Primarch idea, and he said, why not cover all so, we're here. So, one of the other reasons that I wanted to do this was the lion, which is the video we started this series on, and I'm kind of happy about that video. I'm very proud of it. I have a few other ideas for Primarchs that I want to discuss. I do think that the Angron video is going to be a bit of a doozy, but we will get to them eventually. With Ferris Manus, there is a lot to be said. There are a lot of ideas to be shared around with Primarchs, but Ferris, I find the bar for entry is a bit lower for other people to study him. As unlike other Primarchs, he's the first to die in the entire setting. For context, in the 50 plus book series of the Horus Heresy, he dies in book 5, the one titled Fulgrim, which legit caught me off guard when I was doing my first run through of the Horus Heresy because I had no idea he died that early on into it. Now, of course, there are more stories about him throughout the series, but I find that in the chronology of his life in the Horus Heresy, he dies really, really early. And I think that is kind of one of the most singularly important events in the history of 40k and 30k as a whole. I have a lot to say with Ferris, which is weird because you wouldn't think I would. But who is Ferris? Let's break this down into my normal three parts and go from there. So for one, who is Ferris Manus? And where did he start? He was, like his brothers, sent off in an incubation pod against his will and the Emperor's will that caused a great deal of trauma and trouble to the planet of Medusa. And because of his arrival, the planet actually became a bit unstable. He was jettisoned violently into the, like, crust of the planet, kind of similar to what Kurz did. And after he finally crawled his way out, he was able to accomplish probably some of the biggest things that a Primarch has ever done on his own. To list off a few of his most notable ones, he rallied a lot of people on the planet, got all the clans to work together, allegedly swam to the bottom of the ocean, which is... okay. And the one of the bigger ones is that he ended up fighting in a head-to-head -head duel, or well, a war, with the Emperor. And in terms of raw strength, he was kind of top of the heap and genuinely kind of made the Emperor a little nervous. The Emperor was going to win because, I mean, it's the Emperor. The only thing that's kind of above him is one of the Chaos Gods or one of the Catan, but even then it's kind of a close bet, so the fact that Ferris could even put up a fight was kind of impressive. So aside from him fighting the Emperor, the other thing that people know about the most is the fact that he fought some ancient Necron construct that he drowned in a sea of lava that gave him the silver arms that he has that were coated in necrodermis. Allegedly, it also gave him his steely silver eyes, which is kind of an interesting idea that the necrodermis might not just be skin deep. Now that you know kind of a little bit about his backstory, one of the points I tend to enjoy making about him is that he is not really a nice guy. He actually has a lot in common with Perturaba, weirdly enough. I think there is ground for discussion here. I think you can compare Perty and Ferris and not be completely laughed out of the discussion as long as you kind of have read up about the two of them. They are both stern perfectionists, though they both go at it differently from different angles. They punish severely the act of failure. Albeit with Ferris, it's less stern in terms of its punishment. Like, there is no decimation, though he does reprimand and discourage weakness with severe punishments. Where Perturabo stands, strength, weakness, it's all the same as long as you get everything completed and he is 100% satisfied. He doesn't care if you are the weakest person on the planet as long as you can accomplish the task that he sets out for you, and whatever task is set before you, 
you're perfectly fine. With Ferris, it doesn't matter if you succeed or fail, you must be strong, or rather you must be without weakness. This idea of flawlessness is kind of the obsession that he has. He is seeking perfection, and I think that's very interesting. It's why Ferris and Fulgrim had such a brotherly bond as both of them sought out perfection in their own way. Ferris through being the best at accomplishing the task of war and Fulgrim through artistic endeavors. Them sharing that little competition upon first meeting each other to form that brotherly bond was very interesting and for those of you who don't know the story, Ferris thought Fulgrim was just some foppish idiot who was all style and no substance and Fulgrim thought that Ferris Manus was a simpleton, a, a brute with a club kind of deal. So they challenged each other to see who could make the greatest tool of war, and in sort of a, a show of I can do your shit better than you, they both decided to make weapons that would suit the other person. So Ferris Manus obviously made a beautifully ornate eagle crafted sword by the name of Firebrand, and Bogram made a great hammer by the name of Forgebreaker. Through the months of them working on this, they looked at each other and essentially just said, nah, you're dick bigger. Considering they said that at the same time, they just went, ah, and finger guns, and then hugged, and then swapped weapons, and that's kind of their main weapon for the longest time. It's why things became a little bit tragic when we get to part two of this discussion, which is why things get a little bit tragic later, but we'll get to that once we hit part two. So I still want to discuss his impact on his legion, which is the most interesting part that loops back around to my main point of this video. So Ferris has this idea of purging weakness and it's such a non-heavy-handed way that his legion wants to emulate that above all else. So they begin to replace pieces of their body, replacing them with cybernetics. With Ferris Manus leading by example, you know, you got the legion, the Iron Hands, who is led by the man whose name means Iron Hands, whom has Iron Hands, and the legion themselves is replacing their hands with Iron Hands. <sighs> God, GW can just not write subtly sometimes, but yeah, I think that that's very much an interesting discussion point, because we'll circle back to this later. I think there is this perception people have of him, the idea of him being summed up in two ways only. The first way is in relevance to his death, and the second way is in relevance to the necrodermis on his arms, as well as his stern pragmatism. I tend to take a bit of a unified look that's somewhere in between the two of them, as to why he's important. As in, one of them is the cruelest plot twist imaginable. He was beginning to see what was happening to his legion. I firmly believe that the Primarchs themselves are supposed to represent the good of humanity, not just the greatest a person can be without a spirit. I think deep down, no matter how cruel a Primarch is, they are always human. They have this innate kindness to them, this innate sense of justice. It's the environment around them that twists them. Yes, even him, I think he can be a nice guy. I think he could have been a great little meow meow, but we had to ruin it for everyone, okay? Okay. So the plot twist here is that he was seeing that his legion was devolving. He saw that they were becoming more mechanized. The idea of accomplishing a task as simply as a machine, and a machine doesn't care about the people they save, only that they kill who they are sent after. There's, say, a war raging on a planet. They are not there to save the civilians, they are there to kill the aggressors, and that's the key difference. Where the Blood Angels are there to protect the cities, the Iron Hands are there to destroy the people who are attacking. From a reductionist point of view, the same thing, but you can see how that simple change in mindset can lead to a lot of atrocities, which is why when Ferris started to see that the spirit of his legion, the very soul of what it means to be human and be a warrior, is being eroded away for the sake of efficiency and strength, he, once Fulgrim had betrayed him and he was being lured into the Istvan Five Dropside Massacre, there was a moment of understanding that once the war was over, he had claimed to himself that he was going to find a way to remove the necrodermis on his arms, genuinely reducing his level of strength, because with the necrodermis, he was considered one of the strongest, if not the strongest, in close quarters combat primarchs out there. 
even in the final duel with Fulgrim, he was just kicking his ass until the greater demon of Slaanesh gave Fulgrim that supernatural power to overpower Ferris. So the idea of him taking it off to show that strength of body is not nearly as important as strength of character, I find that shows a great deal of growth in him as a person and him as a character. I... <sighs> I think it shows the tragedy of someone who comes to realize things and the mistakes of their life a bit too late, as he would die before he could even mention this to anyone, and because of this his legion fell into the cybernetics thing significantly more. They viewed the loss at Istvan 5 as a weakness on the part of the people who were there and a weakness on the people whom were assisting them. They still hold a grudge against the Salamanders and the Raven Guard for the death of their Primarch, and I think that is such an interesting way of blaming others as opposed to them. This translates to an extreme in the modern day of the setting. Hell, most of their successor chapters have such an obsession with perfection that it's almost a key feature of being an Iron Hand successor. The Brazen Claws alone are so obsessed with removing weakness that they actually go out of their way to murder civilians cold-bloodedly if they think they are being too weak even for humans. And that's kind of why I think Ferris Manus as a character is so interesting, as he did what he thought was the best way of doing things because it was the most efficient way to fill the progress bar up to 100%, but he was doing this not recognizing that his actions don't exist in a vacuum. He doesn't exist in a vacuum. The perceptions he puts out for others is what inspires others to great deeds and deplorable acts. The Iron Hands are one of the most neutral, if not evil legions that are loyalist in the setting in the modern day, and this is all because of the example that Ferris Manus set for them. They do things that would be considered genuine villain level in most other settings. The only reason why we don't consider them horrible in the 40k setting is because they are so useful and they are so good at their job and they remain loyal. The idea of self-reflection and refusing to acknowledge your own mistakes having repercussions that live long past you do is a very important aspect of life. It is furthermore important for people to understand that things are almost never black and white. Getting something done does not mean that there is only one good way of getting it done. Things always require a bit of nuance to understand. Sure, you were tasked with annihilating a rebellion force but blowing up an entire city of civilians and all before leaving without providing aid might be the easiest way of accomplishing that and sure, eventually things would go back to normal and oh man, 20 years in the difference doesn't really matter that much, but your actions will have a rippled set of consequences that last for way longer than what you would think, and especially in a continuity that is 30k going into 40k, we still see the repercussions of the scars left by that war in the modern day. Look no further than the Black Legion as they are just one gaping wound that has never truly healed. Which in the end has left the 40k version of the Iron Hands slowly descending into mechanical heartless cruelty without them being kept in checked by Ferris Manus, and I think that that is such an interesting idea. There is a bit of a change, and we'll cover that in just a second, but I just want to say, I think that's why I like Ferris Manus. There isn't a lot to know, as he dies quickly, and pre-Great Crusade, we don't know much about him, but because of that, there is such an interesting cross-examination of the idea of even if you succeed in the short term, in the long term, you could still be rendered a failure. You can still be seen as someone whom, although you succeeded in the task, your actions have led to a net negative. And that's why I think that Ferris Manus is best exemplified by the idea of just always falling short somehow. He's a nuanced character. I think he doesn't get enough in terms of writing and in terms of just people saying things that aren't jokes about him. I understand that a lot of novels that focus on Ferris Manus are a bit dry and a bit tough to get through as people don't really understand how to write 
beat the Iron Hands. But I think it's very interesting to look at him as someone who failed even if his intentions in the end were good. I forgot who said this, and I'm probably paraphrasing the living shit out of this, so if you know who I'm talking about, feel free to comment it down below and I'll be like, hey, we're best friends now. But regret only forms when you can no longer control what happened. Which is why the Iron Hands, even though they try to remove most sentimentality from their minds, they still hold a love, a sadness, and a grief for the loss of their primer. Some even denying it even happened, which is insane because they have the body. Which unfortunately, this isn't like with Rogaldorn or the Khan, where we don't have his body and he is presumed to be dead, but was probably not and is probably coming back. No. We know that Ferris Manus is dead, and if they're going to bring a Primarch back, it is definitely not going to be him. And I think that that makes the grief and denial of the Iron Hands much more interesting to look at. Regardless, I think there is hope for the Iron Hands. They are slowly learning to accept their emotions as a source of strength, and try to incorporate them into their ways of war around their sense of pragmatism. Though we do get absolutely no novels for them, so maybe that will just go the fuck away, I don't know. But what do you all think about Ferris Manus and his long-lasting repercussions on the Iron Hands? Is he an interesting sort? Is he a boring Primarch? I know a lot of people think he is the most boring because we know the least about him and there's the least characterization for him, but I think he's inherently interesting because of the long-lasting repercussions his life and death represent. Let me know in the comments how you feel. Also, remember to like and subscribe as it does help the channel. Special thanks to my channel members for supporting me, and with your help, I'm able to do these videos and uh, live and not die. That's, that's kind of cool. And if you want to support me and provide me with the way to not die and also gain access to additional and early content on the channel, then become a channel member today. Thanks once again for watching. And before I go, I'm proud of myself for not making one headless joke throughout this entire video. It feels like it's just a bit overdone. It's like making fun of the fact that they're I iron hands, iron hands, iron hands, but yeah. I think it's just kind of this very common thing where the 40k sense of humor is, um, kind of, kind of bad. Like, it, it's just the repetition of the same old memes over and over again. I mean, why, yes, the lion does seem to be on the autism spectrum. What of it? He's still my baby boy who can do no wrong with some war crimes now and then as a treat.